In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In today's Gospel, we hear a debate among the Pharisees, those famous lawyers from the Scripture, or at least trying to debate with our Lord about the law. What is the greatest commandment? And, of course, the Lord says to love the Lord with all of our heart, with all of our strength, with all of our mind. And then, of course, he follows that with, and our neighbor as ourself. And then at the end of the passage, he tests the Pharisees and asks them a question. What do you think about the Christ, as we just heard? Whose son is he? David, and then the Lord makes the point that how does David in the Spirit call him Lord? And of course here the Lord is demonstrating his divinity because of course he is the Lord. He is the incarnate Son of God come in the flesh. And as it says in the scripture that no one can call Jesus Lord unless it be by the Holy Spirit. And David, way back, is calling the Christ Lord. He's calling a son of David down the years Lord. And he is the Lord. He is our Lord. And just like with the Pharisees today, the question for us remains is, do we believe it? Do we truly believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, become incarnate in the flesh for our salvation? And if we believe it, do we realize the immeasurable grace, the incomprehensible grace that has come into our midst? Do we contemplate on the incarnate Son of God present to us in his church? This is why in our, our fathers have told us to study the scriptures, for one thing, to, to come to the church, to receive the body and blood of Christ, to hear the good news, and to meditate on these things. Not just intellectually understand them and say, yeah, I can sign off on that. I can sign off that, okay, Jesus was the Son of God, but is it a matter of faith that affects us? that causes us to act, that causes our lives to be transformed. Believing it, having the faith that we are called to in our Lord Jesus Christ, what the Lord says is what is the great commandment to love, it matters to us. And if we do not believe, why would it matter? We would be concerned, and I, I'm preaching to the choir because I know all of you are faithful men and women and children. Uh, but if we do not have faith, why would we bother with any of this? If we don't really believe, we ought not come. In Romans chapter 7, and this, this becomes part of the rub for Christians 
and throughout all generations, and including in this generation, and you've heard me speak about this before, Romans 7, we'll start with that. For the good that I want to do, I do not. But the evil which I do not want to do, that I do. And just speaking from personal experience, just like Paul did when he, when he said this, I experience that every single day. So we're called, we do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, come incarnate in the flesh, died on the cross, rose from the dead, conquered death, and has brought us with him and provided a way for the whole of the cosmos, not just all of the human race, to rise up into that with him, to be risen with him. And despite how much I may contemplate the, I can only describe it as the incomprehensible grace, the fire hose of grace that this is, I still fall into what Paul says in Romans. We know what we ought to do. And again, this applies for me first. <laughs> I know what I ought to do. Maybe you, know, you have experienced this as well. We know what we are called to do, especially as Orthodox Christians. I don't just mean morally, because there's the idea out there that, well, I'm a good person. I, I, I don't murder anyone. I'm not robbing banks and I'm not uh, beating people up or, you know, whatever. I'm a good person. And the idea that that's good enough for God. And that's, that's great, but it, it doesn't end there. We know what we are called to do. And that is, of course, we want to love our neighbor, which I guess would, we could say is manifested in being a good person, not going out and, you know, again, robbing somebody, not doing ourselves harm, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. But the first great commandment is to love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and every ounce of your being as though your life depended on it. And it's, it's here where at least I get the rub that we're called to this. And, and I know it intellectually, but there, there are those things that are just... The things that I want to do that I do not. Be holy. To be holy. As in the scripture it says, be holy for I am holy. And the spiritual medicines that reside in the church. Believing that the church is truly Christ still present in the world. The God man still present. And the abundant grace still flowing out into the creation through his gathering, through the church itself. Do I believe that? <laughs> but again, another quote from the scripture. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. I delight in the law of God after the inward man. And thankfully, we have the sacraments. And again, do we truly understand what is occurring in the sacraments? When it comes to laying aside our sin, our passions, those things that we don't want to do but we do anyway, As has been revealed through the ages, accountability 
for those things is, is crucial, which is why we have, by the grace of God and in, in God's knowledge, the sacrament of forgiveness. When confession, we come, we confess those things that we don't want to do, but we do anyway. The, the harmful things, the, the sinful things. We name them, we put them out there, and because we do that, there's a sense of accountability. By the grace of God, the Lord has appointed his priests to be shepherds, and the priests help hold the faithful accountable for their faith, for that pearl of great price which, which we have received. Like steel sharpens steel, I think there is also, and if, if you've seen the survey yet, the, the question about whether we hold one another accountable in, in, as members of the church. Not in a critical way, not in sort of a judgmental way or anything like that, but just encouraging one another, one another. Oh, I love to see your face. I love to talk to you. I can't wait until next Sunday. I hope you can come. As our, our fellowship grows and grows and our bonds, where we become closer than our own f family ties, And we become like steel on steel. Remember, confession was public originally, where people would talk about their sins and their passions with one another. Well, abuses arose, and so now it's, you know, the priest represents the congregation, and it occurs that way. I mean, for one, I'm thankful for that. <laughs> um, but we can find victory by the grace of God over these things that we don't want to do, the sin in our life, those hurtful things, by seeking accountability before God. The solution is Christ. He is here and present, and we fly to him. Again, like we're suffocating, and we're trying to get that breath And when we flee into the church, we breathe freely. I hope nobody here has ever experienced a collapsed lung or something like that, or uh, gasping for breath. Anybody with asthma will understand this. And finally, when that breath comes, it's beyond relief. And similarly, with our God. The Pharisees, actually, in the, the very next verses, the Lord begins to chastise them for going through the motions. You know, thumping the law and wanting everybody to follow the law, but then themselves not doing that. Not themselves doing the most important thing, like love your neighbor. In addition to the finding victory over our passions, to accountability, to fleeing to the church, participating in the life of the church and fellowship, is also striving to remain sensitive, and I don't mean emotionally. to allow and to nurture our consciences. It could be argued that today there's, in the media and all of the stuff out there that we be, are becoming desensitized to what is right and to what is wrong and to what is sin and what is not. I mean, some of the things on TV and in films these days are, I mean, the violence and I'm, it's just crazy. 
to the point now where they're, and I've experienced e this even a little bit, that, well, maybe a lot, uh, that seeing these horrible things, they don't faze me. We want to nurture a sensitivity of conscience. And this comes, of course, by not being easily offended. If somebody points out a fault, and that it may be a sin, you know, judgment or whatnot, but somebody does that, we're humble, we don't let that offend. We allow our consciences to be sensitive. And primarily sensitive to our heart's greatest inmost desire. And the question then is, is it the world or is it Christ? Is it, is it God? And uh, brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you that you've heard of the God-shaped hole and sort of filling it with, well, that's truth. The inmost desire of every human being is union with the living God and to experience the bliss that we can't put into words from communion with the living God. We've heard it proclaimed. These are the promises from our Lord to have eternal life in heaven, the kingdom. And we can't wrap our minds around the bliss and, and the grace and the, that that will be. It's beyond words or expression. That is our inmost desire. If we allow God to stir us in moments, say, and I don't know if you're about me, I get home at night, it's very late, and oh, I've got evening prayers, I'm so tired, well, I, I'm so tired, and I find myself in bed, and oh, I'll make my cross. Lord, have mercy. Maybe say a prayer or two and then go to sleep. Other times, I may be tired and I come in and I'm doing the same thing and my conscience is pricked. It's like, you can say a, your prayers. It's only a few more minutes. And sometimes I allow my conscience to lead. And some of the fathers will say that those are actually the angels trying to encourage when that happens. Sometimes I'll obey my conscience, or the angel, if you will. And sometimes I won't. But this is what I'm talking about in terms of sensitivity, that we, we pay attention when this happens, that we receive them as, as graces coming into our lives, because Again, we're so active that we disregard so many things coming at us that we disregard, perhaps, at least I know I do, some of the grace of God that's coming at me to encourage me to do the, the things that I want to do and to disregard those things which I know I ought not do. I would that you be hot or cold. Another passage from scripture which is so challenging. I would that you be hot or cold, not lukewarm. So on this day, as we contemplate How do we engage in the spiritual life in a concrete fashion? How do we proclaim the Lord to be the Lord from before the ages? How do we know him? How do we walk the path that he has laid out before us that leads to him deeper and deeper? by living the life 
in his body that which we are. With God, all things are possible. I once resolved, you know, before you become a monk, there, there's a, at least a three-year period of testing your vocation. And even before that, I resolved that no matter what happens in my life, and this can be very difficult, and it's not just for monks, but to have resolution that no matter what happens in my life, I'm not going to leave Christ. I am not going to, I'm going to remain in the Holy Orthodox Church, no matter what happens. I might be the most lukewarm person on the planet, but I am going to remain in the crucible where despite me, the Lord can transform all of us if we have but just the faith of a mustard seed. He will multiply the loaves in our lives. Let us remain faithful. Let us truly embrace and live lives as Christians who experience Christ in our midst at every moment. Christ is in our midst, together with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Amen.